All right, get ready for a real head scratcher today, folks. We're tackling a question that's got philosophical gears turning. Can atheists really live consistently with what they believe? And we are diving deep, man. We've got the errors of atheism mm -hmm. right here and right next to it. A whole different take from a reformed Calvinist viewpoint. Talk about a philosophical showdown. Sometimes the vessel falters, crumbling in his hands. But the potter never gives up, he has a perfect plan. He reshapes the broken pieces with patience and with skill. And what was once discarded now reflects his perfect will. On the poles, we were spinning round and round and round. Until we're heaven bound Every crack and every fall He'll mend with tender care For the part his hands are faithful And his love is always there But here's the thing that's always gotten me It's not about gotcha moments, right? It's bigger than just atheists. This whole idea of whether our beliefs actually match up with how we live, I mean, that's something we all kind of wrestle with, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. We've all got that friend. Heck, maybe we're that friend sometimes who says one thing but does another. But for this deep dive, we're really honing in on that tension within atheism. Right, exactly. So no one gets confused when we're talking atheism here. We're not just talking about not believing in God. We're talking hardcore. No higher power, therefore life itself is just meaningless. What? Zero inherent meaning. Think Bertrand Russell. We're just little specks of dust in this giant, indifferent universe. No big plan, no reward system in the sky, just existing. And then, lights out. Okay, so, pretty bleak stuff, but here's where my brain starts to short circuit. There are tons of atheists out there living super more, super driven lives, right? volunteering, fighting for causes, finding joy in all kinds of stuff. Which is where this whole debate gets really interesting. Critics are like, hold on, you're basically borrowing meaning from other systems like Christianity that D.O. have God as the ultimate source of purpose. Like that atheist professor our sources mentioned who throws this huge Christmas bash every year. Yeah. Kind of funny when you think about it, right? I mean, picture it. Celebrating a holiday all about the birth of a figure who, in Christian belief, represents divine purpose. Yeah. But you believe this life is it? No judgment day or anything? Where do those warm and fuzzy Christmas feelings come from then? Should we be checking if they've got a secret C.S. Lewis book hidden somewhere? Just kidding. But it does make you wonder. If there's truly no God and life is inherently meaningless, can you logically celebrate Christmas like that without some inner conflict? Million dollar question. Mm -hmm. And look, it's not about calling anyone a hypocrite. It's about the logic of the worldview itself. Can atheism really stand on its own when it comes to meaning, purpose, those big things? Mm -hmm. Or is it kind of propping itself up on other systems without always realizing it? Okay, let's get granular. The sources bring up Bertrand Russell. Again, Mr. Life is absurd. But this is also the dude who was fiercely anti-war, even went to jail for his beliefs. So if nothing ultimately matters, where'd that fire in his belly come from? Total contradiction, right? How do you reconcile nothing matters yeah. with actions driven by a deep sense of moral urgency. What are you fighting for if everything just disappears anyway? And it's not just him. Richard Dawkins, huge name in atheism, argued against any objective good or evil, but then he turns around and passionately condemns things like religious indoctrination, calls it harmful to kids. Hold up, to say something's harmful means there's some standard you're judging by, right? right? Even if it's not God-given, that suggests there is a framework of values at play. So are even the most diehard atheists pulling from frameworks they're trying to reject. It's like we're wired to seek meaning no matter how hard we try to deny it. Okay, devil's advocate time. Don't all beliefs have some quirks when you try to apply them to real life? It's messy out here. Are we being too harsh on atheists expecting perfect consistency? It's a fair point. No philosophy is going to be an airtight equation. But here's the catch. A belief has to be something you can actually live by. If embracing it fully just leads to despair, then shouldn't we at least consider whether it needs a tune-up? So it's not just about intellectual honesty, it's about whether you can actually function, actually thrive with a belief system. Hit the nail on the head. And this is where it gets super thought-provoking. The Notre Dame Philosophical Review, they bring up another option entirely. Agnosticism. Maybe we just can't know for sure if God's there or not. That uncertainty, they argue, might actually be more intellectually honest than straight-up atheism when you think about it. So instead of, there's no God, therefore life is meaningless, it's more like, I don't know if God's out there, but I'm still going to try to live a good life. 
Yeah, but then that opens up a whole new can of worms. What defines good in that scenario if there's no ultimate moral authority? Talk about a philosophical rabbit hole. My head's spinning already. We've covered so much ground, questioning whether atheists are truly walking the walk, exploring this idea of borrowing, meaning even dipping our toes into agnosticism, and we're just getting started. Okay, so we've been really picking apart this idea of whether atheists are really living by their own rules. But one thing that keeps popping up in the sources is this whole suppression thing. Yeah, like they're holding their breath philosophically or something. But suppression of what, right? That's where it gets interesting. Don't leave me hanging. What are we talking about here? Well, the argument goes something like this. Deep down, humans are wired for meaning. We crave it. Purpose something bigger than ourselves. It's in our nature to ask, what's the point? And who hasn't had that little existential freak out at two in the morning? But I think I see where you're going with this. Exactly. Atheism, when you get down to it, doesn't have a concrete answer to that yearning. If there's no master plan, no universe creating being, our lives are just a blip, right? Which, to be honest, can be a pretty depressing thought if you let it linger too long. That's what critics are pointing out to really live by atheism. You'd have to suppress that very human need for meaning. You'd have to accept that your existence might not have any big cosmic significance. And all that suppressing, forcing yourself to be cool with a meaningless universe, I mean, that could really mess someone up, couldn't it? It's a strong argument. I mean, we're not robots, right? We're driven by connection, purpose, hope. To deny that part of ourselves, even if it's in the name of being intellectually honest, it seems kind of backwards. Like trying to convince yourself you don't actually like puppies. Impossible. Right. And that's why some of these sources suggest that atheists who are living happy, fulfilled lives, they're almost in denial. They're borrowing meaning from other frameworks, even if they don't realize it, without ever admitting it. So they say life has no inherent meaning, yet they still find joy in relationships, dedicate their time to causes, try to make the world a better place. Exactly. And all those things that desire to connect, to make an impact, it all comes from wanting meaning and purpose. Even if they reject the idea of God, those desires are still driving their actions. Trying to have their philosophical cake and eat it too. But we're not going to go throwing around hypocrite accusations, are we? Not at all. It's not about judging people. It's about scrutinizing the belief system itself. Does it hold up when you apply it to real life, emotions and all? Because a philosophy that looks good on paper but makes you miserable in practice? Well, that's not super helpful, is it? Exactly. That's the litmus test. If a worldview just leads to despair, apathy, that sense that nothing you do matters, maybe it's time to go back to the drawing board. So it's about finding that balance. Being honest about your worldview, but also being real with yourself about whether it's a sustainable way to live. That's the core of it. Can you really embrace the idea of a meaningless universe and still live a life that's full of joy, purpose, passion? Or does that require, you know, maybe a little subconscious borrowing from systems that offer a more comforting, even if less rationally pure Man. perspective. Man, there's so much to unpack there. You know what, let's shift gears a bit. The sources bring up some interesting criticisms of the whole Christian take on meaning and purpose too. What's the other side of the coin here? Right, it's not like Christianity gets a free pass in the meaning of life department. Mm -hmm. One of the main critiques is that it relies too much on external validation. Well, it's like Christianity is saying our meaning and purpose don't actually come from us. They come from God. It's like, mm -hmm. my life only matters because God says so. Instead of, my life has value because I'm human, I can think and feel. I can see how that might rub some people the wrong way, especially those who value autonomy, you know, yeah. figuring things out for themselves, like they're being handed a pre-written script instead of getting to write their own story. Exactly. And then there's a whole can of worms about free will. If God's got this plan, does that mean our purpose is predetermined? Do our choices even matter, even the bad ones? It's like we're back to that actor versus playwright debate. Interesting. So both extremes, like hardcore atheism, A&D, super strict Christianity, they both seem to have their own issues when it comes to meaning, huh? It's more of a spectrum than a black and white thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the point. There are other ways of thinking about meaning and purpose that don't fit neatly into those boxes. Okay, now you've got me curious, what are these alternative routes to Meaningville we're talking about? So maybe ditching the rule books and really exploring these other ways of finding meaning? That's the move. It's more about a perspective shift than anything. Instead of getting hung up on finding, like, the meaning of life, capital M, the whole shebang, what if we focused on creating meaning in our lives? 
Ooh, okay. I'm liking the sound of that already. Mm -hmm. It's like we're taking the driver's seat instead of waiting for some external force to hand us directions, you know? Exactly. And there was this one metaphor source used that really clicked for me. They were talking about life being kind of like a tapestry. Okay, I'm intrigued. Go on. So we've all got these different threads, our experiences, the people in our lives, passions, all that. And we get to weave those together to create something meaningful and, well, beautiful, really. Man, I love that. So it's not about searching for some pre-designed pattern, but about the actual process of weaving, making it our own. Exactly. And just like a tapestry, the beauty isn't in finding the right way to do it. It's in the individual expression, the way all those colors and textures come together to make it yours. That makes a lot of sense. But okay, if we're not getting our sense of meaning from like a higher power or some inherent value baked into the universe, mm -hmm. what's the foundation then? What makes this self-created purpose actually, you know, yeah. matter? Oh, the million dollar question. Well, one perspective is that meaning often comes from the act of creation itself. When we do things that let us express ourselves, make something new, bring some good into the world, we're tapping into this deep well of satisfaction. So it's about the process, the journey, that joy of creation, more than some external validation or destination that's already been decided for us. Right. Think about that feeling you get when you finally finish a super tough puzzle or you learn a new skill. It's the sense of, I did that. You created something meaningful with your own two hands. Or uh, your brain in the case of that puzzle. But yeah, I totally get what you're saying. It's about that fulfillment that comes from creating, even if it doesn't have some big cosmic significance. Exactly. And look, it doesn't have to be these huge monumental achievements either. A lot of times it's those smaller everyday acts of creation, baking bread, writing someone a real heartfelt letter, even just cooking a delicious meal for someone you care about. It's about being present for those little sparks of joy, the moments that make us feel truly alive and connected. Yes. And, you know, it's not all about like things we create either. A huge amount of meaning comes from how we connect with other people, the relationships we build, the life we give and receive. Absolutely. Those relationships are the threads that hold everything together. They give our lives that richness, that depth, even when things get rough. And those connections, they don't have to be just romantic or immediate family either, right? We find meaning in friendships, our communities, even just little interactions with strangers throughout our day. It's about realizing we're all part of something bigger, that our lives have the power to affect others in ways we might not ever fully grasp. Right on. And that brings us to another biggie when it comes to meaning. Contribution. When we give ourselves to something larger than ourselves, volunteering, fighting for a cause, even just trying to leave the world a little better than we found it. It taps into this profound sense of purpose. Like we're hardwired for that. Finding meaning and being of service, knowing that our actions, even the small ones, can ripple out and actually make a difference. Exactly. And that sense of purpose, that I'm a part of something bigger feeling, it's incredibly motivating, incredibly fulfilling. And it's there whether or not you believe in an afterlife or have it all figured out about the universe. So it's less about finding the answer to the meaning of life and more about this journey of creating meaning in our own way, right? That's it. And that journey is going to look different for everyone. There's no one right way to find meaning and purpose. The important thing is that we're looking, that we're open to the possibilities, and that we allow ourselves to find joy in the everyday, even without absolute certainty. That is powerful stuff. And you know what? It really hits home. It's not about having all the answers, but about being okay with the questions, the not knowing, and finding the beauty in the journey itself. Beautifully said. And I, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. This deep dive has been quite the ride, questioning atheism, looking at critiques of Christianity, and then exploring these whole other paths to finding meaning. A real philosophical roller coaster. But you know what? I'm walking away with this feeling of, like, hope. Just because there's not one single answer to life's meaning doesn't mean our lives are meaningless. Exactly. If anything, it's an invitation to create our own meaning, find joy in the journey, and embrace the beautiful mess of being human, you know? Love it. So, to everyone listening, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep creating your own beautiful, meaningful tapestries. Remember, the journey itself is where the magic happens. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Until next time, folks, keep diving deep. In the hands of the potter, with a clay soft and new, a vessel takes its shape, with every turn and view, each crease and every line, 
molded by his grace though the process may be painful he's forming something great on the palace we were spinning round and round and round through the fire and the pressure until we're heaven bound every crack and every flaw he'll mend with tender care for the potter's hands are faithful and his love is always there Sometimes the vessel falters, crumbling in his hands But the potter never gives up, he has a perfect plan He reshapes the broken pieces, with patience and with skill And what was once discarded, now reflects his perfect will On the polished wheel, we're spinning round and round and round Through the fire and the pressure, until we're heaven bound He'll mend with tender care For the potter's hands are faithful And his love is always there When you feel like you're shattered And your strength is wearing thin Remember you're in the hands Of the one who'll shape you from within He'll refine you in the furnace He'll mold you through the strife And when the work is finished You'll be a vessel full of life we were spinning round and round and round Through the fire and the pressure Until we're heaven bound Every crack and every flaw 